persons might be affecting you know, things like electrons and positrons and neutrons and so on, which make up the universe of modern physics. And so now that I've explained uh, modern physics as a branch of primate psychology, if you've been following me, uh, we, 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 we are domesticated primates. Uh, wild primates mark their territories with excretions. Domesticated primates mark their territories with ink excretions on paper. Every national border in the world uh, is a territorial mark for two rival gangs of domesticated primates fought until they were exhausted and then signed the peace treaty. And uh, that's the equivalent of the chimpanzees throwing ex excrement at each other until they get tired and then they all excrete on the line, which indicates the mark that the two chimpanzee tribes will be separated by. If you saw 2001, you understand these territorial reflexes. The, the territorial part of the, of the brain, the, the old mammalian brain, is what generally governs human affairs at this stage of evolution. Uh, which is to say, the only intelligent way to discuss politics is on all fours. It's all mammalian uh, quarreling over territory. Uh, Ronald uh, Reagan, Ronald Wilson Reagan, as you know, he's got six letters in his first name, six in his middle name, six in his first name, six, six, six. Uh, it says in the book of Revelation that the beast 666 will be wounded in the head and he will rise up stronger than ever. And Reagan was wounded in the head and rose up to get the biggest electoral vote in American political history. That's because domesticated crime banks will never vote for a candidate who seems smarter than they are. Uh, Jimmy Carter, when he was running for office, managed to hide the scandalous fact that he had a master's degree in nuclear physics because that might make some people feel inferior to him. They covered that up until after he was elected. He was just a simple peanut farmer. After he got elected, and the word got out that this man was a nuclear physicist, so he didn't get re-elected. Uh, Ronald Reagan got the biggest votes in American history because nobody in the whole country felt intellectually inferior to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> you can go to homes with a feeble mind and ask them, what do you think of President Reagan? They say, oh, Ronnie, he's a regular fellow, just like us. <laughs> Ronald Wilson Reagan, if you permutate the letters in his name, you get insane Anglo warlord. Can this be an accident? Uh, if you permutate the letters in George Herbert Walker Bush, you get huge, huge berserk rebel warlord. <laughs> that sort of describes current uh, policy in Washington. Uh, these things can't be accidents. Uh, when you use every letter and you don't have any letters left over, it works out that neatly. This must be a secret Kabbalistic message from the author of the uh, universe. The evolutionary function of stupidity. I love this chair. This, this chair makes the whole experience of appearing here into an adventure for me. Uh, I find there are three positions in this chair. One leaning forward, I'm uncomfortable. The other leaning back, the chair feels like it's about to turn over and I'll bang my head on the floor <laughs> behind me. And there's a third position in between in which I'm comfortable and the chair doesn't seem about to fall over. But it's very hard to maintain that position. I keep falling back into the one where it feels like the chair is about to turn over. So this keeps me from being bored. I don't know how it's <laughs> funny. It's stoic, but I find it funny exciting. The, uh, the historical, uh, the evolutionary function of stupidity. Uh, most people think stupidity should be abolished, and I have, I've written on that uh, subject myself. I've written a whole essay in the Illuminati papers on the possibility, the desirability, and the immediate urgency of abolishing stupidity. Uh, it was back in 78 I wrote that. Since then, I've been reflecting a lot that there's so much stupidity around. And it's been around for so long, it must have some evolutionary function. As J.R. Bob Dobbs says, praise Bob. <laughs> uh, you know how dumb the average guy is? Well, mathematically, by definition, half of them are even dumber than that. Uh, J.B.S. Holbein, the great British biologist, was once asked, if you admitted a mind behind evolution, what is the principal characteristic of that mind? And Haldane answered at once, an inordinate fondness for beetles. 
<laughs> and indeed, there are, there, there are not only more beetles on this planet than anyone else, but there are more different species of beetles than there are of all the other insects put together, and all the fish, and all the birds, and all the mammals. Uh, the mind behind evolution seems inexhaustibly preoccupied with creating new types of beetles all the time, or more, bigger and better beetles. And anybody who has a garden realizes how effective that program is. Uh, beetles must be serving some important evolutionary function, or there wouldn't be so many of them. I wrote a whole novel once called Schrodinger's Cat, which was largely told from the point of view of the six-legged majority. I thought, why do we always write books from the point of view of this two-legged minority on the planet, uh, when the majority of the planet citizens are six-legged? So I wrote Schrodinger's Cat, which uh, is partly told from the perspective of the six-legged majority. Well, uh, taking a similar evolutionary perspective, uh, why is there so much stupidity around? The mind behind evolution evidently has great fondness for idiots and epistles. Uh, just look at Congress. Uh, why is there so much stupidity around? Uh, there was another thought in there that somehow got lost in the easy flow of conversation and the general relaxation of the occasion. The function of stupidity is to force the intelligent to get more intelligent. The function of stupidity is to get the world into such a state that the intelligent get into a state of emergency and rush around madly in all directions trying to fix things up before everything falls apart. In other words, the, intelligence, the intelligent minority is continually being goaded into becoming even more intelligent by the behavior of the stupid majority. You can see that very much in the current environmental movement where the intelligent minority is running around desperately to keep the stupid majority from destroying the planet entirely. Uh, one of the great examples of the historical function, the evolutionary function of stupidity, is the banning of LSD research in the 1960s. When lysergic acid diethylamide uh, was discovered by uh, Hoffman on April 23rd, uh, 42, a day that will live in glory, um, it took a while before uh, psychologists and psychiatrists found out what this stuff was good for. Hoffman thought he was making a headache remedy, amusingly enough. <laughs> and, uh, he inhaled some of the fumes of this alleged headache remedy and got on his bicycle to go home for lunch, and that was the longest bicycle ride in history. <laughs> in, uh, in the 50s, some began to discover that LSD suspends spread, conditioned and imprinted brain programs, and the brain leaps into action. When you take out the habitual programs, the brain starts creating new programs. And that led uh, some uh, to develop the hypothesis that uh, if you give people LSD in a controlled, uh, supportive situation and suggest new programs to them, they'll imprint the new programs and new perceptions and behavior can change radically in a revolutionary way. Uh, Timothy Leary, of course, was the first to say this is the penicillin of psychology. This is just like penicillin has revolutionized medicine, this is going to revolutionize psychology. And people started doing studies all over the country and in Canada and other places in which fantastic changes in behavior were observed. There were cases where they cured schizophrenia with one dose of LSD. There were cases where it didn't work. There were a number of cases in which autism, childhood schizophrenia, was cured. At Spring Grove Hospital in Maryland, they were curing alcoholism in one session beating the record of AA fantastically. And up, at, uh, up in Massachusetts, Leary took a bunch of criminals and took several LSD trips with them. And he defined uh, that experiment in very operational, nitty-gritty terms, the way physicists measure things. He said, we're not going to talk about neuroses or social adjustment or psychoses or any of that gobbledygook which nobody understands. We've got one criteria, where are the bodies in space-time? That is, one year after release, where are the bodies of the criminals? Uh, statistically, in the United States as a whole, and in Massachusetts, 80% or 85%, it varies from state to state, in Massachusetts it is 85%, 85% of all convicts, one year after release, you will find their bodies back in prison. They have done one thing or another to get themselves back in prison. Parole violation, holding up a liquor store, smoking a joint, 
uh, being seen in a bar uh, of a heinous actions of that sort or violent crimes. In one way or another, they got themselves back in prison within one year. Leary's convicts being treated with LSD and uh, mystical uh, oriental literature and uh, light classical music uh, underwent changes in perception where they came out of their criminal reality tunnel, looked at the world through a different reality tunnel, decided they liked the new reality tunnel. And one year after release, instead of 85% of their bodies being found in space time within the prison walls, they were found holding jobs in various areas of Massachusetts not back in prison. This is the most amazing uh, uh, success rate in the whole history of criminology. So naturally, we really got fired from the prison, Massachusetts prison system, got thrown out of part, it was colorfully slanted, it was finally railroaded into prison, and the LSD was made illegal. Uh, it seems there's a vested interest that we got to have a criminal class, because too many people would be out of work if we started changing all the criminals into law-abiding citizens, or something like that. And probably it's just that stupid people feel that anything is new, it must be bad. So anyway, they stopped LSD research, uh, which I think was the stupidest thing that happened in the 1960s. Now I will show you the evolutionary value of stupidity. As soon as they stopped LSD research, the people who were involved in LSD research, thousands and thousands of psychologists and psychiatrists started asking themselves, can we get some of a brain change equally rapidly by investigating new techniques? So they started investigating direct electrical stimulation of the brain. They started investigating the effect of sound on the brain, light, how does light affect the brain? John Lilly invented the Lilly isolation tank which uh, turns out produces effects very similar to an LSD trip. Uh, they discovered biofeedback, which is a way of getting signals of what your brain is doing and from the signals you can learn to control your brain and move into different patterns. And uh, the general estimate given in most scientific literature these days is we've learned more about the brain in the last 20 years than in all previous human history put together. And this is all because they took our acid away from us. Uh, everybody started investigating. We would have discovered all these alternatives if it hadn't been for that. So, you see, the function of stupidity is to force the intelligence to become more intelligent. The first of uh, the modern generation of brain machines that I tried was the Pulse Star, invented by Mike Hercules, uh, a retired NASA engineer who was interested in alterations of consciousness. This was in Boulder, Colorado four or five years ago. And I went through on the Pulse Star. He took me through various brain changes, all of which I found very interesting, like the 10.5, where you hurt so you feel very serene. And it's possible to do a lot of self-healing work at 10.5 hertz. I've done a lot of experiment with it since then, and I've confirmed that many times. One to seven point five hertz, which is the deep meditative state you only get into after months and months of practice and regular meditation, and you usually can't hold on to it. Uh, when you reach seven point five hertz, the immediate reaction, if you're practicing meditation, the immediate reaction is, "Hey, I finally done it! Look, I'm not talking to myself anymore." Wait a minute, who's that talking? <laughs> oh, right, I ruined it again. Uh, the tendency with the machines is you can get to 7.5 hertz and stay there. And the verbalizations go away and you get into very deep meditation. This chair is about to fall over. This is lots of fun. The trick is to lean back and keep my feet firmly on the floor at the same time. At uh, 4.0 hertz, some very interesting things happen. Uh, in research today, 85% of all subjects that 4.0 hertz tend to have out-of-body experiences, which are very interesting and educational, however you explain them. And there are numerous explanations floating around, uh, starting from A, we literally are going out of our bodies all the way to Z, it's only a hallucination. There are a lot of alternative theories in between those two extreme positions. I, I prefer the theory that we're not in our bodies at all. Uh, I don't think consciousness is in the brain. The brain receives consciousness. Consciousness is probably a non-local function of the space-time continuum. 
and every individual brain is an individual receiver, just like the world is full of television signals, and each television set is a receiver. The delusion that you are in your body is a uh, primitive, uh, savage uh, kind of uh, kind of taking uh, the data of perception at face value, similar to the delusion that Johnny Carson is inside your television set. Mm -hmm. Uh, Johnny Carson is not in your television set. Johnny Carson is in Hollywood. Your television set just receives Johnny Carson signals. And consciousness is not in the brain. The brain just receives signals from the vast, undifferentiated ocean of consciousness that makes up the space-time continuum. That's the way I prefer to uh, explain out-of-body experiences. Those of you who are interested in that line of thought will recognize this is the philosophy of the Upanishads and the Buddhist scriptures. It's also the philosophy of David Bohm, one of the leading quantum physicists alive today, as explained in his book, Hold, Listen, the Implicate Order. It's also the attitude of uh, George, uh, I almost got it mixed up with Bush, Edwin Harris Walker, not George Herbert Walker Bush, but Edwin Harris Walker, a leading American physicist in a booklet called The Complete Quantum Anthropologist. He explains consciousness as a non-local function of the whole space-time continuum. And Schrodinger, the, practically the main inventor of quantum mechanics, had the same attitude. The sum total of all minds is one, Schrodinger said. Anyway, when Mike Hercules put me at uh, 4 hertz, he attached another machine to my forehead and said, we're going to make a brainwave on you while you do this. So at 4 hertz, I went out of his laboratory over the Rocky Mountains, over the North Pole, over Iceland, found Ireland, found Dublin Bay, found the Hill of Hoth, found my house on the Hill of Hoth and went in, looked around my house, came back out, flew over the North Pole and came back to his laboratory. And I thought, boy, this, this machine sure does encourage vivid visualization. <laughs> and uh, then he showed me the uh, brainwave of that experience and I had uh, zero brainwaves, no alpha, no uh, beta, no delta, no theta, no nothing. It looked like the graphs of 2001, life functions terminated the flat lines. I had no brain activity at all. Now, that gave me quite a lot to think about. I've been thinking about it ever since. Uh, I've been investigating these brain machines ever since. There are dozens of them on the market. There are little ones like the Endomax that just attaches to the mastoids and sends sound waves to the mastoids behind the ear. That affects the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus controls the amount, uh, the amount of neuropeptides that are being produced. Uh, if, you're, if you're producing a lot of endorphin, pain tends to go away, so these uh, machines of that sort are being used in treating post-operative shock in a lot of hospitals. There are light machines where you just look at a flickering light and when it reaches the alpha rhythm, your brain slows down to the alpha rhythm and you get into meditation. You can slow it down further to the delta and you get into deep meditation or you go to sleep. You can slow it down to theta and in that case you're going to be uh, having types of consciousness not normally experienced in our society. Then there are the light and sound machines where you use both flickering light and the pulsing sound and you uh, can turn them to any level you want. And uh, now, now they're, we're starting to see light sound and uh, suggestion machines in which you get the light uh, waves, the sound waves, and somebody using Ericksonian hypnotic techniques or neuro-linguistic programming to tell you you're now capable of solving all your problems and you don't need to waste a lot of energy worrying anymore because your brain is now working efficiently to solve all your problems from now on. And if you're listening to that in the state of Delta, you don't have much cynicism or resistance. You tend to believe it. You become a much more competent and creative person. Uh, this whole field is, to me, one of the most exciting fields around it. There are also machines that send elect direct electromagnetism through the brain, which is certainly the strongest of all techniques. The brain can't resist that. It has to go into the rhythm. Um, there are... Uh, psychoimmunology tapes that are now being made. They just use sound and Ericksonian hypnosis, but those tapes seem to be dynamite and uh, clearing up uh, a great many tensions and uh, 
minor illnesses, and they may even be affected uh, against major illnesses. We don't know. They just haven't been tested enough yet. Uh, this, this field uh, is uh, the most exciting uh, area of research in the world today, is, in my opinion, because all we know is what registers on our brains. Everything else is inference. I, I, I'm inferring all the time that from what registers on my brain, I guess what's going on in the room. I'm, I'm inferring more or less correctly most of the time because I very seldom bang my leg on the low stool. I hardly ever fall over the couch. Well, except when uh, I've got a bottle of Irish uh, whiskey in the house. Uh, but every, everything we think we know about the external world is a function of how well our brain is operating and how many circuits of our brain are operating. If we're stuck within the particular put-on of the culture we were raised in, one particular reality tunnel, we screen out a lot of signals we could otherwise be receiving. If we learn to adjust our brains to different frequencies, we pick up more and more signals. We build a bigger and bigger reality tunnel or a reality labyrinth with multiple choices instead of just a dead-end reality tunnel. Uh, learning, learning to adjust the brain means that we'll uh, learn to adjust all of our perceptions and all of our sciences and all of our philosophy and probably our religions and our politics too. Uh, the next step is obviously computerized brain machines in which you take the brain waves from, say, a Zen master. There is a machine called Mind Fear which gives you an exact reading of both the right and left hemispheres of the brain and how much alpha, how much beta, alpha, theta, and delta there is in each hemisphere. And you can see the distinctive patterns of different types of people. Zen masters have a pattern that's very much like the, uh, the, uh, the picture of the wheat on the, um, on the sign outside here. That's sort of shaped like the Greek letter omega. It's equally balanced between right and left hemispheres with beta, alpha, and delta activity going along at pretty heavy rates, but theta going at even stronger rates than uh, the other three. Uh, there's a distinctive pattern for artists and for psychics and businessmen, and you can learn to change your brain patterns. The next thing will be with computers. You take the Zen master's brain pattern, feed that into the brain change machine, that'll feed that into your brain, and you'll be thinking, feeling, perceiving like a Zen master for a couple of hours. And then the next step is we get John Lilly to volunteer. We take John Lilly's brain waves, we put that in a computer, and run that through a brain machine, and you're thinking, feeling, perceiving like John Lilly for 24 hours or whatever. Uh, Einstein is dead, but uh, following along on this line is thought Einstein's brain has been preserved. I, I have high hopes that in the near future somebody will make a cell out of Einstein's brain. You can spare a cell. You can lose a cell from your brain anytime without it doing you any damage. I mean, in case anybody's got plans to revive Einstein entirely, if you take one cell out of the brain, you can still do the job. If you take one cell out of Einstein's brain, you can extract the DNA and the RNA, and then you can put that in the pill. And then you've got an Einstein pill with Einstein DNA and Einstein RNA. This is going to be done in the near future because if I can think of it, others can think of it. Some people, somebody's either going to get the research grant to do it in the commission from Yeshiva University, which has Einstein's brain, or else they'll creep in at night with a hunchback system. You know how those things go. Anyway, we're going to have Einstein DNA and Einstein RNA pills around very soon. And, uh, uh, the, uh, the revolution of our times, the neurological revolution, I call it the head revolution, H-E-A-D, that stands for hedonic engineering and development. Now, throughout history, uh, domesticated primates have behaved just like the conditioned rats in a behaviorist laboratory. Our reactions have been largely mechanical. And our rational uh, centers of the brain are devoted largely to making up rationalizations to explain why we're doing these mechanical things and convince ourselves we're choosing to do them. The yogis and the Sufis have known that for a couple of thousand years. The behaviorists discovered it at the beginning of this century, uh, so it became part of Western science. The difference between the conditioned rats 
in the laboratory and the conditioned workers in an office building is very, very mind uh, Sometimes you can hardly tell the difference, especially when the bell rings uh, dinner. Uh, you see all the same uh, conditioned uh, patterns. Uh, with this new technology, the head revolution, hedonic engineering and development, we're learning to program our own brains. So instead of being programmed by the conditioning system of society, we can reprogram ourselves, recondition, reimprint ourselves, and begin to use the human brain for fun and profit for the first time in history. It's been estimated just last year, with state-of-the-art technology, the technology is accelerating all the time, but with state-of-the-art technology last year, to build a computer, the equivalent of your brain, any one of you, uh, would have to be as tall as the World Trade Center and as wide around as the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And you've got that fantastic computational capacity there between your ears. Unless, like Dan Quayle, you can clean both ears with one q tip mm -hmm. by pushing it straight through. But if you're, if you're an ordinary human being, you've got all this fantastic computational capacity, and uh, what are you doing with it? it, it it's absolutely incredible uh, what our brains can do and how little uh, that we're using them for. When I write my book on God's 17 Worst Mistakes, which I'm planning to do in, in the near future, the first one I'm going to, the God's major wonder was he gave us these wonderful brains and he didn't give us an operating manual. And so we've been using the brains just like animal brains throughout most of our evolution. That's what Koshipsky called copying dogs and cats in our, behavior, in our neurological behavior. Uh, Mark Twain said anti-Semitism reminded him of a dumb cat who sat on a cold, hot stove and then sat on a hot stove again. And the anti-Semite said, well, what was dumb about that? And Twain said the cat never sat on a cold stove either. And that type of conditioned reaction is all too prevalent in human affairs. Most people live in very narrow reality tunnels governed by the conditioned stimuli they receive as children. That's why people born in Dublin tend to remain Irish Catholics all their lives. People born in Moscow tend to remain communists and atheists all their lives. People born in Ohio tend to remain Republicans all their lives. Mm -hmm. People born in Samoa tend to practice the Samoan religion and worship deities. We're all infinitely flexible when we're born and we take the form of whatever society we want and we become obedient little robots within the robot hierarchy of that robot society. All of this is coming to an end. We are learning to free our brains and be whatever we want to be. And that is just a brief introduction to give you an idea and a bit of evolutionary perspective on where we are in history. We are at the turning point of history where we cease being conditioned animals and start to become homo sapiens. And now we will uh, let you sample a few of the machines and we got to find out just how many interesting things you can do with your brain that you never did before. chart and graph, you know, I didn't, didn't realize it was probably more complex than it seems, but it seems pretty simple. Um, my experience was, I 
don't know. More seemed to happen as I got off the machine than was happening while while I was on it. So for me, it's tremendously re relaxing afterwards. Still just, going on? Yeah, for me, I just feel like very woozy. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> when you get down to alpha and uh, theta waves, uh, the brain starts generating a lot of neuropeptides. And it takes quite a while for them to travel throughout the whole body. And that's why you have effects for hours afterwards in these yeah. machines. You've got neuropeptides running all well over the, 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 Among other things, they're boosting your immunological system. Or at least that's what the data indicates. So you should be unusually resistant to disease for the next day or so. <laughs> I'm also interested to see how I feel over the next uh, few hours and also how my consciousness is tomorrow. I was sort of hoping that I was going to have some kind of out-of-body experience or, uh, you know, psychic visions. I, because I've never tried them before and I didn't know what to expect, but I miss, uh, in years past I used to do psychedelics and since I don't do drugs anymore, I miss certain experiences that I used to have that were really wonderful to me. And so I was hoping to find some approximation of that. Well, it wasn't that, but, uh, you know, I feel very good now. Of course, here I've just spent a couple of hours practicing on stop and the machine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I actually bought the little biofeedback machine the little hand holder, because that is, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in a training program to be an Ericksonian therapist, and uh, I've been practicing self-trance, and also with the other therapists in the program, we practice on each other every week, and when I get put into deep trance, I love that state, and every once in a while down there, I'll have this semi-psychedelic this was actually, for its size and portability and low price, I could say that like a commercial. <laughs> I was very surprised I'd never tried anything in biofeedback before. It helped me go into a self-trance that was deeper than the self-trances that I've been experiencing on my own. And oh, I like that. Uh, you ought to write the psychoimmunology tapes uh, Dora of North Carolina. I don't remember their address, but Dora, you got a phone book. Uh, they, the psychoimmunology tapes use Ericksonian hypnosis together with uh, the sounds that move the brain down to the low frequencies. You find that very rewarding. Ericksonian brain. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting for me. I've never, uh, I've never used any of the machinery before, and I've really been very interested in the functions of the right and left brain. And I hope that uh, something that I got here today will help me to learn how to integrate the two because I've done different things like the very simple thing but being added extra so that you develop the hemispheres and that type of thing. But uh, the tapes that talk in your ears at the same time, I can't decide if it was helpful or annoying, but I, <laughs> but it, it had it had a certain effect that lasted after the tapes were done. It was it was so uh, Um, I'm feeling so Excuse me. It was sort of like a buffet, but it wasn't really enough. <laughs> 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 no, uh. I realized that, it, that these were all things that I would have to learn to work with, and then that led to the obvious conclusion that I would have to acquire one to work with it. It's something that I would have to train myself to use. And that wasn't, certainly wasn't as easy as psychedelics as you know, that just takes you someplace instantly. With this, you really have to, you would have to work with Machinery, you have to learn. Allowing something to affect you. On, on the other hand, uh, when you turn the machine off, what you have afterwards is uh, a sense of tranquility and uh, nice. bursts, of, bursts of creative energy. 
Uh, whereas if you take a psychedelic in the next eight hours, you have to deal with a lot of problems in the external world. Well, that's true. You want to start about control, not a control situation. Yeah, this thing is good. This thing gives you at least a lot more control. And it's legal, so. And they're still legal. Let's hope they will remain. Still legal. And you might find out that it's changing people's attitude about how they react to society. Because I think the original problem was LSD. I think, yeah, uh, I think it was, yeah. Uh, and most of the Willie Wright's toys. Uh, what? <laughs> most of the Willie Wright's toys. Yes, <laughs> yes. The, the uh, bio circuit thing is very much like the Reiki uh, or Bone Accumulator. As far as I can understand, there's no scientific principle that explains this. Therefore, it can't work. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out why it does work. It's like the orgone accumulator, it works even though it shouldn't. Yes? I think the authorities are afraid that people will start seeing traffic lights and watching them for him. Like Rain Man. <laughs> okay, uh, instead of going around the whole room one by one, who else wants to make it? Comment. Anybody experience something different than we've heard about? Something exceptional? Anything you want to share with us? Yes? Um, Voyager 7 there was a point in which I got to a state where I would swear I heard water, running water in my way. When I left here, I forget the location somewhere in the Dolphin. <laughs> I'm not saying that lightly because I've spent a week recently with Dolphin listening to the water. And uh, I know that the machine wasn't generating that time, mm -hmm. so something happened with my brain and the machine. Yeah, yeah, there's a marked increase of psychic experiences of people who use these machines uh, for a while. It's I not picking up things from the entire world. Outside. If I uh, thought of something hard enough, I could visualize, I could make it come together and have it that I saw. Birds, so animals. What frequency does that do you experience <laughs> that? Yeah. I don't know. I think she was wondering if I thought it possibly around 3-5. Yeah, it's just occurred to me that my body was having an out-of-mind experience. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's probably a very accurate description of it, actually. Uh, what we normally consider our mind is the brain operating in a peculiar way conditioned by our culture. And it's generally operating mostly in the left hemisphere and mostly above 12 hertz, uh, frequently quite a bit above 12 hertz. And uh, that's what we consider our mind. And the machines take you out of your mind and back to your body by moving you into both hemispheres and uh, the lower frequencies. When you're largely operating above 12 hertz out of the left hemisphere, you're uh, using chiefly your sympathetic nervous system, which is oriented to the outer world, manipulating things. And when you go below 12 hertz into the right hemisphere, you're operating on the parasympathetic nervous system where you're getting a lot more information about what's going on inside your body than you normally get. And so it is uh, liberating the body from the limits of mind. Or at least that's one way of thinking about it. Timothy Leary used to say psychedelics liberate brain from the limits of mind. Yes? I noticed that the new star, I guess it's there at the 7.5 to 7. Frequency. I was I was real tranquil. I had mean, almost in the five set it to effect. And if I left it on, I probably would have fallen asleep. And then down to lower lower end of the scale, I sensed that that was a place that could affect the uh, deep tissue and bone. And I've got a sore right knee, and I concentrated my energy towards that. And it's, it's not as stiff, and I was very uncomfortable. Yeah, there's research being done on, the, on this. Uh, nobody wants to know that people who make these machines want to talk about it prematurely because the FDA is renowned for jumping all over people who make medical claims before they have enough evidence. 
but there there is some evidence that uh, on those very low frequencies, uh, especially 1.05, that a lot of deep healing goes on. And certainly, even when you get down to just uh, mid alpha, like 7.5, uh, you're boosting your immunological system, which is certainly giving you more resistance to disease. But uh, as I say, the manufacturers are afraid to talk about that yet. It's one thing the FDA hates is pretty much your medical claims that haven't been well documented in double, uh, double blind studies and so on. But there's a lot of anecdotal information around among manufacturers and producers of these machines. I've even heard claims that bald headed men have grown their hair back, although I haven't met any of those bald headed men yet. I'm not, so I'm, I'm not going to vouch for that one, but I've heard such legends. People start using the machines and their hair stops growing back. Uh, yeah, there's research going on at various universities, but it hasn't been published yet. I saw a preliminary report from one university that indicated that uh, <coughs> they were combining it with uh, positive suggestion. They were using the pulse star and the positive suggestion, and they, they were getting good results in their preliminary report with a variety of uh, serious illness problems. But that's only a preliminary report. I don't want to claim too much. Actually, the reason I'm so fascinated by these machines is I suspect that a great deal of blood has been proven so far. Yes? Which, uh, which of these machines do you use? Uh, I have experimented with uh, the Pulse Star, the Endomax, Neural pep, the bio circuits, uh, psychoimmunology tapes, the TENS unit, the brain potentializer, the David, the mind mirror, and a few others I uh, don't even remember the names of anymore. Uh, I, I think the strongest, the most powerful one around is the brain potentializer, and that's also the most expensive. Oh, I have a lot of sessions on the Synchro Energizer, too. There's a lot of Synchro Energizer shops around these days. Is that Genesis? Is that Genesis? I don't know what's Genesis. There's, there are a couple of them here. There's one in New York and one in New Jersey. And primarily for doctor prescriptions that people are in the center. That might be. Uh, the Synchro Energizer is a, a very complicated device that you can uh, run uh, the, the uh, wires out of it. You can put up to 20 people uh, through a session simultaneously. And it, it, it's a, there's, a, there's a very strong feeling, uh, suspicion that uh, when 20 people are doing it together, there's some kind of group effect that occurs where you're getting even deeper. Anybody who's done ritual in a group has noticed that also. Well, I like the Tibetans all chanting the same mantra together, about 50 of them together, rather you think of that. It seems if you get everybody in the room working, their brains going at the same frequency, that some kind of group of mind starts to appear. It seemed like when I, I used the synchronizers in New York with uh, several other people in a group setting, uh, the telepathy was increased dramatically. Uh, as we went over our experiences, it, uh, we, uh, several of us started to tune in to the, the, the woman who was choreographing our session. And uh, there, was a, there was a certain point within the whole session that uh, this, Jap this Japanese film crew came in to interview uh, people. And we noticed distinctly that, that she was no longer putting the same kind of energy that she was prior to that. She was now kind of disturbed by or whatever, going somewhere else than where she was at, at that particular time of her choreographing uh, the, the session. And several of us tuned into that immediately. 
deeper in this state of mind than I do. Kind of a strange over. <laughs> okay, I'll tell the old pot jokes from the 50s. Oh, when hardly anybody was smoking pot. And uh, these jokes were very inscrutable and to most people. Well, and what's so funny about that? Uh, two uh, progressive jazz musicians come out of the nightclub and a fire truck goes racing by with a siren screaming. One turns to the other and says, Man, I thought they'd never leave. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's like the one about the the two got the, the, the two stone cats standing outside a record shop and, and meanwhile forty two stories straight up the uh, two uh, masons are balancing this huge bell into a cornice. The bell falls and lands beside these two guys with a crash that breaks windows three miles away. And one of them turns to the other and goes, hey, what was that? E flat. <laughs> County Kerry man who was visiting New York City on holiday and he found everything enchanting the gigantic buildings, the perpetual mystery how the streets get that way that the people from Brooklyn and Queens really come over at night and don't take garbage here. Or <laughs> what is it? And all, uh, all the exciting things about New York. And he began to realize there was one thing he missed terribly, and that's that you can't get Guinness on tap in New York. Get it in the bottle. And this joke, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> he found there were very few places in New York where you could get it on tap. He, <laughs> he complained to a friend of his from Dublin, and the friend said, Oh, Patty, I know just the place for you. It's on top of that skyscraper on 6th Avenue, there's a bar up on the top, and they have a like, Guinness on tap. So Patty goes up there, and sure enough, they have Guinness on tap, just like in Ireland. So he has a pint, and since a bird can't fly on one wing, he has another pint. And since a tricycle will move on two wheels, he has another pint. He's getting to a very mellow Irish uh, state of mind. Uh, and when uh, he notices the guy down the other end of the bar who's been drinking again, his toe, uh, suddenly gets up and uh, walks to the window and jumps out. And uh, Patty says to the bartender, my God, did you see that? And the bartender says, just wait a minute. And the guy comes walking in the door from the other end and has another pint. And uh, Patty says, how did you do that? And this gentleman says, well, you see, I've discovered the only, the only the nearest men's room in this building is down on the 17th floor. We're on the 37th floor. It's a long way to the elevator. But I discovered the air conditioning system was on the 17th floor, too. So if you jump out the window as you pass the 17th floor, the air conditioning system sucks you in, and you go right past the men's room, and you grab the door, and go right in. And he says, isn't that marvelous? That's, that's a wonderment entirely. And by then, the, you know, you have a bike, and it will be granted. By then, you need, uh, you need uh, to go to so he goes over the window, and he jumps out and flies down past the window. 30th floor, 25th floor, 20th floor, 17th floor, 15th floor. He said, wait a minute, I was supposed to stop at the 17th. 10th floor, 9th floor, 5th floor, splash! On the sidewalk, up, stop way up on the top of the bar, and he turns to the other man and says, you are a bastard when you have a few pints in you, Superman. <laughs> Yeah, the machine does produce a different quality of life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But they say you know you when you've oversmoked because when you it's when you go to brush something off your shoulder and it's the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, I'll do a recitation from Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> there was a young lady named Puck who had the most terrible luck. She stood up on a punt and got bit on the front by a goose and a swan and a duck. You see, that didn't turn out anything like you expected. <laughs> There, was a, there once was a hermit named Hollis, 
who took gators and possums for solace, the results had scales and long furry tails and voted for Governor Wallace. <laughs> Look out, they're getting worse all the time. You don't ask questions, and I can't think of anything else. I'll just go on reciting one verse to Liggett, Violer, and Violer, and you. Do you have any favorite machines of the ones you used to decide the grand potential? Uh, the Neuropath. I would say the Neuropath with the David, they're both very good. Both the David and the Neuropath. Why is that? Why do you like them so much? Um, they, they work well. I think the designers uh, understood what they were doing. Maybe they like the sound machines, but the frequencies they use are very, very interesting. The David has some uh, myotechnotic uh, suggestions on the tape along with the sounds and the like. The Neuropep has an interesting variety of tapes, so you can take all sorts of trips with the Neuropep. Have you ever used machines while you're writing? Uh, I've tried that a few times. I've tried using the Ento Max while I was writing. I, I wrote up a storm and got a headache. <laughs> <laughs> Does the TENS unit uh, really increase energy levels? Uh, it, defi it, it definitely releases muscle. It definitely relieves muscle strain. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else it does. It I relieves muscle strain. And it seems to be good on various forms of intractable pain. It's getting to be widely used in hospitals. Where they, uh, one of the big problems in modern medicine is uh, people with uh, uh, prolonged intractable pain. Uh, just about anything you do, you can just give them addictive drugs, and then you got the problem. You release them from a hospital, they're an addict, and that's against the law in this country. Doctors have been torn by that problem for a long time. And uh, it's beginning to look like the tense you have may cure most types of pain, and it's not a bit pain. It looks like. I've heard anecdotal information of people that are long driving pills, for example. Yeah. I've heard that too. I've heard of people who attach the uh, tens of to their leg and drive like all day and all night, get it cover incredible distances. And they, apparently, there haven't been any reports of accidents yet, so they're fully alert. Uh, it seems. I, I'm not going to try that myself right away. There was a young gaucho named Bruno. <laughs> Said, about love, there is one thing I do know. Women are fine, sheep are fine, but the iguana is numero uno. <laughs> 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 Thank you see, we gradually descend to bestiality. <laughs> is that a hand? Yes, um, I wanted to know about people and their moods. If they noticed that they were more relaxed or not more relaxed, were they also aware of any mood, like from anger to joy or, or whatever? Oh, that's a good question. How many people felt the uh, switch from negative, emo from negative emotions to more positive emotions this afternoon? Hey, look at that. Uh, and me too. I was feeling kind of tired and uh, harassed. I think I've still got one more workshop to do before I go home. And uh, New York tomorrow. And, and then I suddenly felt I had plenty of energy. Oh, this is easy. I've only got one more workshop. I don't know. Well, okay, I think that's about it. I think everybody's had. Oh, there's one more question. I just was wondering, you know, with the obvious visual hallucination and with mood changing and everything else, has there has anybody published yet on uh, any positive effects with uh, chronic mental health problems that are hallucinatory or chronic depression? So nobody's published on it. There's a psychiatrist in Berkeley who claims he's having unprecedentedly uh, good results treating schizophrenics with uh, one of these machines. He hasn't published yet. I've just heard about it on the great line. He's talking about it. He's telling other psychiatrists who've got it. I've got it. It's right here. Come see. And, uh, I, nothing has been published yet. And so it's 
premature for people to get their hopes up, I guess. But it's, it's interesting that research is being done. Yeah, what I was thinking is, in terms of the uh, of, uh, neurochemical emissions and the possibility that that might have uh, directly affecting organic mental illness. I, I think it's a very hopeful area of research. Thank mm -hmm. you.